Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the eighth Medvacate meeting with Tu Forkner, who is a physician's assistant certified in OBGYN. So really hope you enjoyed today's event. Uh, I'm Anju Nilkumar. I'm one of the events co-directors for Medvocate. Uh, and if you're new, uh, Medvocate is a student-led organization that's devoted to connecting youth to opportunities in medicine. Uh, so if you're not a member and you'd like to be one, uh, there was a registration form that was sent out in the Slack group uh, in the announcements tab. So please go ahead and fill that out if you are interested. Uh, so today's event will count as virtual shadowing hours. So if you would like to receive a certificate, uh, please complete the case study quiz that will be sent out towards the end of this meeting. So you will need to have a two out of three on the case study quiz uh, to be considered uh, available for that uh, certificate. So you'll be sent that certificate in one week uh, if you have received that. Uh, so please try to finish that quiz about 30 minutes after the meeting because uh, we won't be accepting responses after that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, to whenever you're ready, please start. Awesome. So um, I can't really see everybody that's in this group, but um, it's great to meet you guys. So I'm Tu Forkner. I am a physician assistant. Um, I work as an OBGYN um, PA, but I'll kind of go into um, specialties and things like that later on. But we're going to just do like a general overview of PAs and I'll kind of go through my day to day. Um, and then we'll do some case studies at the end. So let's hope technology cooperates with us. So first big question for anyone who doesn't know, what is a PA? So this is just kind of like the generic answer, but basically PAs are healthcare providers that provide um, just kind of like a full range of care for patients. So we can diagnose, we can treat, we can prescribe, we can perform um, procedures, whether in office, we can assist in the OR. So we kind of have a variety of skills. We work in collaboration with the physician, which hence our name physician assistant. Um, and so when you're working your, with your physician, you are able to kind of see patients in a clinical or a hospital or a surgical capacity. So um, the main difference for a lot of people hearing about PAs is the difference between an MD, a PA, and an NP, which is the most common kind of question or comparison that people ask. So MDs or medical doctors are kind of like at the very top and PAs and NPs kind of sit right underneath them. So in terms of scope of practice, the kind of levels of meds that we can prescribe, the types of surgeries or procedures that we can do, it's going to be a little bit more limited than a physician. So, um, and then in terms of NP and PA, so PAs go through schooling with more of a medicine background. So our schooling is set up to kind of mimic the medical model. So you have didactic for a year, year and a half, and then you'll have clinicals for a year and a half. Um, NPs kind of follow the nursing route. So they are a little bit more focused on patient care and like the activities of daily living. So the more nitty gritties of taking care of a patient. And so when it comes to kind of thinking about how to diagnose or treat a patient, the, the school of thought kind of differs a little bit in that scenario. But at the end of the day, our scope of practice is pretty similar. So you can still kind of do similar things um, as a PA versus an NP. But I find that the PA route, it's a little bit more structured. There's a little bit more support there. And because we work in collaboration with physicians, we tend to get more support from other physicians. Um, so that is kind of that definition there if you guys wanna kind of read further into it. And then this picture was um, something that I did with my school. It was for one of their like brochures that they sent out, but this is kind of us doing our IV training. As a PA, you really don't insert a lot of IVs, um, but in case you did, they, they have a little day where we practice on arm dummies and then we practice on each other. So um, the other part of being a PA is being, uh, having a supervising physician. 
And so as I kind of mentioned earlier, we work in collaboration. So all PAs in order to practice in the US have to work with a supervising physician. You can have more than one, but basically they are the ones that give you that prescriptive authority. So that ability to write medications. Also anything that you do. So in terms of all of your medical charts, all your procedures are tied with your physician's license. And so... Mm. That is kind of the nice thing about being a PA that you're never kind of just on your own. You always have a supervising physician who has your back, who um, you can go to for any questions or anything like that. Um, so you always have to have access with your supervising physician, but you don't have to be in the same room. So they don't have to physically monitor you. Um, so for example, with my supervising physician, I see her every day. Our desks are right next to each other, but I have my own schedule and then she has her own schedule of patients. And every once in a while, if I have a patient that's kind of difficult, um, their case is kind of funky or they're not responding to treatments the way I expect, then I'll kind of go and talk to my supervising physician. I'll kind of run through the case with them and we'll kind of bounce ideas off each other. And then I basically just go right back to the rest of my, my patients for the day. Um, and then I'll send notes to her occasionally so she can look over it. So any patients we've talked about, I send it to her just so she can sign off. And you are required to have a percentage of your medical charts reviewed by your physician. Um, I just to kind of let the medical board know that you're getting some type of supervision, but um, just know that supervising physician doesn't mean that they have to be with you all the time. Most of the time you're pretty autonomous. You're pretty much working on your own and you just kind of have this additional resource if you need any assistance or any help from them. Um, let's see. So moving on to like pre PA, which I assume most of you guys are at kind of in that pre stage where you're thinking about what you want to do. So if you're interested in PA school, these are kind of the general courses that you'll need to take. This pretty much looks like a standard like bio or chemistry major in college um, or like I've uh, one that I've seen a lot of is healthcare studies. This is just something that I was on like the prereqs from the application. So I would say if you're interested in going to PA school, certainly make sure you have all of your science classes, but a lot of programs will have one or two random classes that they require. So I would look into the specific programs you want to go to, to make sure you have those kind of random classes. Like some places want you to have statistics, some places want you to have some other kind of class. And so if you want to go there, just make sure you check. But this is pretty much the general look of what it's going to take to get into PA school. So pretty much all of your um, science classes, anatomy and physiology is going to be part of that. Um, and yeah, I think they'll have that random one, like the statistics and the psychology, um, keep in mind though, if at this point, like you are already like the majority way through your degree and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm missing these, or I don't have these. Um, these are not the only degrees that get accepted into PA school. So you can still do a degree that you love and just make sure that you get these classes on the side. So some of them, you know, you can take at your main university. Some of them you can do at a community college. So don't feel like you have to take everything like within a certain time frame. So in my class, we had accounting majors. We had an art major. We had teachers who did a teaching degree and they were still able to get all of their prerequisites and still get into PA school. So don't feel rushed if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm missing like a few of these. Um, you have time and you can just kind of get through them with either community college or just picking up a few courses at your university. Um, let's see. And in terms of the chat, I know it's, it's kind of blown up right now. I'm gonna wait until the end. So if you guys have any like big questions, just kind of hold to the end and we'll do a little Q and A. Okay, let's see. So, Something that I highly recommend for anyone who is interested in being a PA or just trying to find out more to see if this is the right route for you um, are these pre-PA organizations and some of our national organizations. So um, I was president of the pre-PA society at my university 
And so I would recommend if your school doesn't have a pre-PA society that you could start one, or if it does that you join. So they get to invite more PA specific speakers, admissions um, committee members and things like that. So you get a lot more information if you can find those little pre-PA groups um, kind of in your area. Pre-med groups, things like Medvocate are great as well, kind of giving you extra exposure to the profession. Um, and then the two that I recommend just because I'm in Texas is the Texas Academy of Physician Assistants and then the American Academy of Physician Assistants. So they hold national conferences and they always make an effort to create um, these little meeting greets. So you guys can meet with um, practicing PAs, with new graduates, with current students. So those are great places to network, great places to find people to shadow if you guys are interested. So it's a great place to connect. Um, the student memberships are usually really, really affordable and I highly recommend them. I was in these organizations as a student and I think it helps um, the programs know that you are truly interested and that this has been like a long-term commitment and not just something that just like on a whim or because you couldn't get into another program or another school that you just decided to do PA by default. So a good way to show that you have some investment in the profession. Um, let's see. So in terms of volunteering, which I'm sure anyone who's on the pre-med route is very aware, you're gonna be required to do volunteering. Um, these are the things that I typically recommend if you're gonna do volunteering, just because it shows that you're a little bit more um, oriented towards medicine. Um, and these are the common places that I volunteer as, as a student to kind of get those volunteer hours and to show that I was really interested in medicine. So hospital, nursing home, free clinics, school events. Um, so I volunteered at a couple free clinics. That's how I got most of my hours. Um, here in Dallas, there is the Agape Clinic and Calvert Clinic. And then I also went to like the Arlington Free Clinic. So if you guys wanna look them up and kind of see what they look like, but basically there are clinics that helped either those in like low income communities or the homeless community. And so they allowed students to be able to take on a lot of responsibility if you show that you would come frequently. So I got to take vitals. Um, I got to, you know, check blood sugars, um, check, you know, they let me do kind of random stuff here and there. So it was a way to get my volunteer hours. And then every once in a while I could squeeze in like a patient care hour because I actually interact with the patient. So if you're volunteering, even if you're going the pre-med route, try to look for places like this because that can kind of give you that little bump on your application. Let's see. Okay, patient care hours. So for PA school and I I assume for medicine as well, they want to see that you've had direct patient care and that you kind of understand what patient care is about, what health care is about, and also what, what PA profession is about. Um, and so what typically counts as direct patient care is if you're actually touching your patients. So blood pressure, blood sugar checks, um, sometimes they'll do like taking a history or like starting patients on treatment. Um, will count. And so I kind of listed some of the more common things for PA applicants. So a lot of patients were medical assistants, they did EMT, scribing, um, patient care tech, certified nursing assistant. So those are kind of the most common things. If there's something that you're doing, you're like, maybe this counts, maybe it doesn't count, you can always call the programs and they'll let you know if they will count it on their application or not. But I personally was an EMT um, after I graduated college and I worked with a Canadian. I kind of listed their little logo. And then while I was a student in undergrad, I was a medical assistant for a chiropractic office. Um, and so I basically started off as a receptionist and eventually worked my way up to a medical assistant um, to where I was taking vitals, starting stem treatments, starting patients on traction. Um, and that's how I kind of gained my hours. So it's hard as a full-time student to find it, but try to squeeze in those hours when you can and start as early as possible. Um, the last little caveat is if you're doing a place where you can volunteer and get patient care, so don't double dip them on your application. So um, if, you, if you're like spending about like 40% doing patient care and the other 60 doing volunteer, then that's how you'd want to divide up those hours on your application. Um, so don't get in trouble for kind of boosting up your numbers by copying them. 
Um, so let's see. So big one for all students everywhere, and especially during COVID is shadowing. So um, yeah, shadowing is tough. It's a lot of just kind of like cold calling and emailing and searching up PAs um, in your area. I typically recommend, I would just kind of search up any PAs that were close to where I lived and I would just send my resume. I would just call their office manager and see if they would take students. Um, the other thing that a lot of people are doing nowadays is LinkedIn. So I've had students message me to shadow. Um, and I think that's a, an easier way with COVID going around that you don't just show up to the offices. Um, but take your, you know, kind of take your time, do that search, try to find somebody because that is going to be a huge, huge thing um, for the application. So the point of shadowing is to make sure that you truly understand what PAs do and if that's something that you actually want to do. Um, so they really take PA shadowing hours seriously. Um, so that is definitely something you want to start off the moment you realize you are interested in the PA profession, go ahead and start reaching out to local PAs and see if you can get anyone to shadow you. Um, I also know there's a lot of like Facebook groups out there that will um, have forums where students can ask to shadow um, PAs as well. So definitely kind of search for those two if this is something you're interested in. Um, and just know that there's probably a lot of people that will probably tell you no, but you only need a couple yeses to meet your hours. So um, don't feel discouraged because I got a lot of rejections when I was a student. So don't worry about that. Okay. Let's see. So in terms of the exam that you'll need to take, so for PA school at this point in time, the GRE is what you are going to kind of be required to take um, in order to get into school. So the GRE is kind of similar to the SAT. That's kind of how I felt whenever I was studying for it. Um, kind of just the writing, verbal reasoning, vocab, and then um, quantitative reasoning, so like math stuff. Um, I just used study books and did a ton of practice tests. Um, some people feel like they will have to go in and, and do those like prep courses. So it's kind of up to you, but I would assume at this point, if you guys are all um, in college and you guys have taken multiple exams before that most of you um, may be able to just do like a at home study or self study and still do really well. But um, I think they kind of adjust the scores every year on what you wanna get. So GRE score, really good if you get a high score not the end of the world if you get an average score. Um, so don't get too caught up on that. Um, and then the PA CAT is the new entrance exam. They're trying to make it kind of similar to like the MCAT um, where it's more science focused. But as of right now, there's only about, I think like seven or so programs nationally that require the PA CAT. So I wouldn't focus on it too much at this point. I would just try to focus on the GRE in terms of studying, but um, it's just something you have to do kind of for the application. But I think for the most part, this shouldn't take up a huge chunk of your time. I wouldn't focus too much on this part. Okay, applying to PA school. So um, CASPA is our kind of general application. So. For a lot of programs that you want to apply to, CASPA is going to be the website that you're going to want to use. It opens up in April every single year, and I've kind of listed some of the different categories that they require. And, um, and then from CASPA, you'll also get a link to all like the supplemental essays and the supplemental applications as well. So I always recommend, even if you're not applying this year, to get a CASPA account and just look at what a PA application looks like. Um, and from there, I typically recommend that patients set up like an Excel sheet to track all of the stuff that you do uh, because you're going to eventually forget them. So I would say, and this is something that I did starting early on, I would track a tab for all my shadowing hours, a tab for all of my volunteer hours, and then a tab for all of my patient care. Um, cause they do get pretty specific about contact information, dates and stuff like that. And so it's a lot easier if you can just go back and just kind of like copy and paste or transfer it. Um, and the, the main point too, is that if you get all this done, then you'll be able to turn your applications in as early as possible. 
and that is going to give you the biggest leg up on um, other applicants. So a lot of programs do rolling admissions. So the moment they start getting applications, they start sending out interview invitations. And the earlier interviews that you're in, you can, even if you don't get offered a seat that very first interview session, every single subsequent session, they'll look over your application again. So you get more exposure than those who are applying later on and getting in the later batches. So it's always important to get your application in as soon as the application opens. Um, the caveat is that you do require recommendations and sometimes that can kind of hold you back. So I always recommend that you find people who can really speak to how you are in kind of stressful situations or in patient care experience um, or people who kind of know your work ethic. And so I would be very specific when you ask people writing your rec letters to let them know, hey, I'm applying to PA school. If you could specifically talk about how I handle stress, how I deal or interact with other people, instead of just saying like a general recommendation letter, um, cause sometimes that's not as helpful if they're just kind of writing about you in general. So if you want to find someone to write a rec letter, try to be more specific and try to follow up on them because they have other things to do. Sometimes they're busy. And so you want to ask them a little bit early on and then slowly kind of remind them as you get closer and closer. Um, and it's, it's generally a link. So they'll actually have to go into their email to check it. But um, I really recommend staying on top of it because sometimes those rec letters can hold you back. Um, that was kind of a, a quick and dirty of the CASPA. Okay. So if you turn all your stuff in and you get an interview, that is awesome. So that's kind of a huge step into getting accepted into a program. So in terms of tips and tricks, this is what I usually recommend. So a lot of programs, they have mission statements. They've put a ton of time into making. Um, they kind of have all these different little stats about them. And I usually recommend looking those up because you will get asked about them in certain interviews. And so you don't wanna look like you're unprepared, like you just kind of applied to this program. You just picked whatever. So definitely read the mission statement. Um, I would also look into kind of anything special about their program. So if they do like a study abroad or if they, have a specific community that they like to work with. Um, look into all that stuff, look into their pants pass rate, which is our certifying exam. So how many students at the end of their PA schooling become certified PAs? Um, look into all that stuff because I, I know at some point it's gonna show up. So I had a question about like the history of a PA program during my interview and I did not know, so kind of had to talk my way through it, but they do ask about a couple of specifics and then the rest of it is gonna be focused on you. Um, I do recommend kind of practicing normal PA school interview questions because um, you will at some point kind of get asked those questions. So kind of at least practice a couple. Um, they do the typical ones like tell me about a time you've made a mistake and how you learn from it or stuff like that. Um, but don't try to memorize them or rehearse your answers so much that it sounds really robotic. Um, so kind of familiarize yourself because you will see those. Um, and then the other thing I recommend is doing mock interviews, whether it be with your family, with, you know, any of those pre-PA, um, pre pre-med um, groups. It's really helpful to kind of just be in a situation where it's a little bit more formal and serious and practice those questions. Um, and, you know, you can do it for the times that you would like an actual interview where it's only like a 15 minute time slot, but get as much practice so that when you get to your first interview, you're not kind of nervous, or you don't freeze up. Um, and, you know, if you make a mistake, you can learn how you're going to avoid that or how you're going to, you know, sidestep it and kind of pick up from that. So I do recommend mock interviews. Um, and honestly, if you have someone who is a PA or knows about PA school, that would be best. But if you don't, you could just ask, you know, someone that you trust or can give you good advice. Um, the other thing is as a student interviewing for the program, they like to hear questions. So they wanna hear that you've looked into the program, you're interested and you wanna know more. Um, so don't forget, you're also interviewing the program because 
if there's something that they're doing that you don't like, um, or they don't have the type of support you need, then it's not going to be a good fit for you. So I always recommend asking about mentorship and how that is on campus, um, tutoring in case, you know, you're not doing as well, or there's a subject you're struggling in, if they have any mental health resources. So um, counseling for students or things like that, if something happens, um, do they have anything available? And then financial aid is going to be another big one to ask. So I do recommend asking about that as well. Um, same with like any study resources. So do they have like online textbooks for you guys to use? Or are they going to give you like electronics or anything like that access to the library and that type of stuff? So definitely ask about that. Um, and then certainly if there's anything else you're interested in to throw that into, but they really like to see that students are interested and they've done their research and they're looking into the program. Okay. Now you get into PA school. So this is kind of like the general layout of PA school. It kind of varies from program to program, but most programs are about two and a half to three years. So the first year is gonna be your didactic. So it's gonna be your classroom, like book study time. And so this is kind of the more generic, but it's a little bit more from UT Southwestern because that was where I went to school. So first year we did organ-based sections. So we did, the cardiovascular section, we did a GI section, we did a OBGYN section, a PED section. Um, we also did anatomy and physiology that first year. And obviously pre-COVID, we were one of the few schools that actually had dissection lab. Um, and it was really, really cool. I really liked it. I spent a lot of hours <laughs> dissecting, um, but I think it was a really cool experience getting to really see the way the body works and how it looks on different people. So a lot of our cadavers had different organ um, failures, different disease states, um, and it was really interesting to see. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely something to ask about. I know they're having to do it a little bit different with COVID, but hopefully by the time you guys are applying, um, things will look a little bit different and they will allow you to go back. Um, the other thing with PA students is that we start doing standardized patients pretty early on. So in your first year, we're already seeing um, standardized patients or mock patients. They're teaching us how to do the physical exam. Um, so we really get exposed to that really early on. So we do um, a patient interviewing class where we get case scenarios and you kind of practice interviewing somebody. Um, so that is something I really liked about PA school. I think a lot of medical schools, they kind of hold it off a little bit later. Um, and I think that's just because it's a four year program versus a two year. So everything we do is a little bit more abbreviated. So I liked having this early on. So I felt really prepared by the time I went to clinicals because we had already been doing it for a whole year. Um, and then moving on to clinical rotation. So that year you're kind of out um, in different clinics, in the hospitals, Pretty much it's very similar to a medical school rotation. So we do primary care, so family medicine, we do internal medicine. Um, we have a surgery rotation, PEDS, um, OBGYN or women's health. And then Southwestern did an infectious disease rotation, which I think is kind of different. I don't think a lot of other places do that. And then we had a specialty rotation. So I actually got to do adult medicine at the Dallas County Jail, which I thought was was really cool. And then my other specialty was like at the opposite end and I did pediatric ENT at Children's Hospital. Um, so there were things I was kind of interested in or just wanted to try. And so that is something that if you're interested in like a very particular specialty or field going into school, um, I would ask them about if they have specialty rotations or do they have the opportunity for you to rotate in those fields before you graduate? Um, cause some programs do and some don't. And so if there's something you're really interested in or something you just really have a passion for, that is something I would ask about in the interviews. Um, let's see the other thing you do is in a rotation exam. So after each rotation, you'll do an exam about it. And essentially it's kind of set up in the same way our certifying exam is set up. Uh, which is the pants. And so it's kind of like a little bit of prep um, or practice test pretty much all the way up. So you're pretty prepared by the time you get to the end. And then we also do OSCEs, which are um, simulated patient, um, patient cases. And so they'll have a fake patient. You'll go in, you'll see them for 15 minutes and you get 15 minutes to write your note. Um, so that was a good kind of uh, refresher or review of what you've done when you're out on rotations. 
And then we all had to do a master's project. Um, and that just kind of varies on what you want to do. But that's kind of PA school in a nutshell. I will say it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. So just know, just like any other program, it's going to take up a lot of your time. Um, something that they always tell students who are interviewing, they always tell um, new PA students at the very beginning of the year is that you do not want to kind of be distracted by anything else in your life. So try to get everything as set up as you can. So if there's any health issues you've been putting off, go ahead and take care of them. If there's any family issues that you've been putting up, go ahead and take care of it. Because unfortunately, once you get into school, it takes up a lot of your time. You don't have a lot of time to get to go to family events, to get to see people. And your family just has to understand that you're going to have to miss some really, you know, some important things. And that's just because that is the way it has to work for you to really fit in all of the material you have to learn, everything that you have to do. Um, and it, it's tough, but didactic year, I will say is the hardest. Once you get to clinicals, you're more on a work schedule. So that is nice. You kind of get your weekends back. You kind of get your after, um, your evenings back. So if you can make it through didactic, 100% you're going to make it through clinical. So that is the good thing. Um, but I did stay in the library for many, many hours until like late at night. Our library was 24 hours. And I think there were always students there, which is really crazy. Um, but we shared it with like medical students, and like PT and stuff. But yeah, there was always students in the library. So you will spend a lot of time studying. Um, I'm telling you now, so you're not going to be surprised. <laughs> And then after you've finished all your schooling, you move on to PANTS. So PANTS is the PA National Certifying Exam. It's something that all of us take in order to get certified to practice um, in the US, essentially. Um, it is, it is a, a pretty intense exam. I would say it's, it's basically the culmination of everything you've done and it's all just patient scenarios or patient cases. Um, you, it's kind of like a, you go at your own pace and they give you like 45 minutes worth of breaks and you just take them whenever you want to. And then you just finish as fast as you can. But, um, I think as you go through the program and as you take all your end of rotation exams, by the time you get to the pants exam, you feel pretty confident as best as you can, but you're, you're going to be pretty prepared. And a lot of programs have a really good pants pass rate. So you can trust that. The program is structured in a way that they've done their best to give you all the information. And if you're passing all your classes, you're going to be able to pass the pants. And then once you do your pants, then you'll apply for jobs. Um, and most of us went to work immediately after graduation. So there are a few of my colleagues that did go into some specialty fellowships. So ER typically has one. Um, sometimes trauma medicine will have one too, but most, um, specialties or professions, you actually go directly into work right after you graduate. So I went directly into OBGYN after I graduated. I graduated in December and then I started work in March, like February, March. Um, and so I did a lot of kind of on the job, more specific learning to my specialty, but everything else I just learned on the go. So that is a big difference about PAs is that for a lot of us, we start working immediately after we get out of school. And at any point in your career, if you want to switch, you can. So we actually don't have to specialize and most of us don't. We typically switch professions or switch specialties at least once or twice in our uh, lifetime of being a PA. So just know that if maybe you haven't figured out what you want to do, or you feel like you're kind of interested in everything, PA may be a profession that you, you're kind of want to look into. Um, I have, you know, colleagues that do primary care. I have um, people who do pediatrics, GI. We also have people that do more specific things. We have someone that's in breast, um, that's a breast specialist office. So they work with breast cancer patients. We have another one that's doing um, oncology. And so just know that for the most part, a lot of specialties are really open to PAs. Um, and, and if there's anything that you're interested in, or if there's a couple things that you're interested in, this may be the profession for you because you don't get kind of tied down to that one field, um, which is really nice. And so if at any point you're like, you know what, I feel like I've done everything I want to, I want to go ahead and try this other field. Um, you can do it. So the, the options are kind of limitless for you. Okay, next one. 
Oh, so you do get to do fun stuff as a PA student. So this is a picture of us at the Tapa Challenge Bowl. Um, so we had a couple teams go. And so this right here is Dr. Um, Eugene Jones. He was the dean of our program whenever I was a student. And he's amazing. He went to everything. Um, and this is some of our professors that were there too. So you have a pretty close knit community. You have a lot of support. Um, and then there are a couple things you get to do um, in PA school. So just know it's not all boring. And then the other thing that was really cool was that we also got to go on a mission trip over spring break to Guatemala. So we got to work um, at one of the clinics there and it was a completely different experience to what we did here as students in the US. So it was a really awesome opportunity. I know a lot of places have um, kind of international um, mission trips or rotation. So if you're interested in global health, this is something that you could ask them about or see if that's something that they would be open to you kind of helping start in that program. We actually had, this was actually started by one of my classmates. So she was really interested in global health. She was able to set this up for all of us. And so all of us were able to go and now it's kind of a reoccurring thing at Southwestern. So they'll take this um, spring break trip where they get to go to Guatemala in a couple of those different clinics and get to practice there. So um you get to do this opportunity as well. So PA school is pretty cool. You get a lot of different opportunities. You get a lot of different exposure. So um, definitely all things you want to ask about, depending on where you go and what program you're going to apply to. But yes, this was us sleeping on the second floor of the clinic. And this is all outside. And there's animals all out there. And this is a mosquito net. Um, and then this was a classroom for one of the villages that we um, volunteered at. So we had to hike about an hour and a half to get there with all the medicine and everything in our bags. And we just set up these desks as little stations. And then we just kind of saw patients as they would come in and um, kind of tell us what their problems were. So really, really cool experience. Let's see. General tips for PA school. So I recommend finding a study group or finding a couple of people that... Um, are gonna help you study. And I'm sure even now, as you're an undergrad, as you're doing this, you probably have a group that you typically study with anyway. Same thing for PA school. Um, I also recommend not buying every single resource that they tell you. It's not necessary and you don't have time. So just pick one or two books that you really like and just go with that. Um, and then the main part about school is really figuring out your learning style. So for me personally, I, do better with practice questions and practice tests. Um, other people did great with flashcards. They made a bunch of them and they would just go through them. Other people liked like YouTube videos or like podcasts. Um, and so it really just depends, but that's really something important that you wanna figure out early on because that will kind of set you up for success for the rest of PA school. And then um, asking for help meeting your mentors regularly if they have them, um, just asking for help, making sure that if you need anything, whether it be um, emotional support, academic support, um, if something's happening financially, always go to your advisors or to your mentors because um, they all, almost always have some resources for students. I already talked about sorting out all that stuff. And then money. So. If you're able to work before PA school, save all your money for PA school because you will not really be able to work. Um, I worked for like a little bit as a, a student at like the rec center, um, but that was because they let us study pretty much the entire time that we were there. But for the most part, a lot of us did not get to work at all. And so definitely save up money, um, look into all that financial aid stuff before you get in because it will be worth it. My little money spiel. Okay, so the pants and the panry. So I kind of talked about it earlier. The pants is the exam that you have to take in order to become certified. So it's five hours. You get 45 minutes um, in terms of breaks and it's 300 questions. Um, like I said, pretty much patient scenarios. And then you actually have to recertify every 10 years. And so the recertification is a little bit shorter, but still pretty much the same setup. And we take a general sort of um, certification exam because we're technically trained in general medicine. So we should be able to kind of answer questions in a variety of specialties. A lot of us before this recertification exam take a course um, to kind of refresh us on whatever fields that we have not been working in. And for the most part, people are able to pass it and they're able to do okay. But 
keep in mind that in order to keep your license up to date, you do have to recertify every 10 years. And then in between every 10 years, you'll do continuing education hours. So just like um, physicians, just like nurses, it's 100 hours every two years and you have to meet that requirement. Otherwise you're gonna be put on probation. So it can be category one or category two. So conferences, articles, um, quality improvement projects, things like that. So all of those count, but that's something that everyone does. You'll spend a lot of time reading about your patients anyway. Um, so a lot of times it'll fall under that and you'll be able to meet that pretty easily. Okay, practicing medicine the more fun stuff. So um, I talked about specialty. So PAs are trained in, trained in general medicine, but you can work in any single specialty. Um, these two are the only ones I've ever seen in terms of like um, residency for. So emergency medicine and urology. So a lot of emergency medicine residencies, you'll work for a year and then um, they'll kind of send you to whatever, whatever hospital they want you to be at. But um, obviously understandable because emergency would be a lot more fast paced and PAs in the ER um, are sometimes the, the person that's receiving patients coming in from the ambulance. And so they really want you to be able to know what you're doing and be really comfortable doing it because a lot of times the um, trauma doc is going to be elsewhere doing something else. And so you are going to be in charge of that patient. So um, it's a really cool place if you kind of like that fast pace and you kind of want to be in charge. Um, but yeah, they take a ton of PAs and they do have a residency for the most part. Um, so you're not kind of left out on your own, but pretty much everything else you're learning on the job. So for women's health, um, I personally chose women's health because I like educating women about their bodies. Um, I felt like growing up, we really did not talk about women's health, women's anatomy, what's normal, what's weird at all, um, especially in my family. And so I just didn't like that very much. I don't, I think that was a huge disservice. And so I, in my day-to-day -day, day job, I get to just educate women, even about just like basic anatomy. Like this is where your urethra is. This is where your uterus is at. This is where, how these all relate. Um, and so I really enjoy that part of my work, um, getting to educate patients and really getting to answer their questions and spend more time with them um, and kind of dispelling myths. I hear a lot of strange things from patients and I get to tell them that, that's wrong and that you do not have to worry about that. Um, and I get to give them good information so that when they hear other people telling them stuff, they can tell them that is not what my PA told me. I don't think you're telling me the truth. So, um, I really enjoy that. And so I had a little slide in terms of my day to day as an OBGYN, um, PA. So this is kind of a little run through of the the variety of patients that I see in a day. So we see a lot of well women's or a lot of annuals. Um, I do a lot of educating about routine screening. So about HPV um, vaccinations, mammograms, pap smears. Um, and we also do other stuff like colonoscopies and things like that too, in terms of reminding them to stay up to date. Um, I see patients for their pregnancy confirmation visit. So that first visit tends to be a longer one since a lot of patients have questions about pregnancy, symptoms they're experiencing. So I spend some time with them there at that first visit. Or unfortunately, if there's anything wrong, then I'll do the workup necessary to make sure the pregnancy is progressing the way we expect. So um, I do that. And then I'll see OB patients throughout their pregnancy as well. So for various visits, um, for monitoring and things like that. Typically they'll alternate visits between myself and with my supervising physician. Um, I talk to patients about birth control a lot, cycle management. So whenever your menstrual cycle starts, you know, acting funky or it's not showing up or it's showing up too much, I'll handle that as well. And then we do some procedures in the office. So I remove and I place IUDs, which are intrauterine devices. We do that in the office. Um, Nexplanon, which is an arm implant birth control. I'll place those and remove those in the office. We'll drain cysts, um, suture removals. So from patients who have had C-sections or um, like abdominal hysterectomies, when we do their incision check, if there's anything that needs to be removed or hasn't dissolved, we'll do that in the office too. So there are a couple things we can do in the office. I typically am able to do that pretty much on my own. Um, I do not have call on nights or weekends and that's just the way it's been set up so keep in mind there are pas that take calls so 
you definitely, whenever you're applying for a job, want to kind of look at the fine print because some places will have you on call. They'll want you on call on rotating weekends or they'll want you on night call. So be very specific about that. But I typically just work my office hours and then I'll come in a little bit earlier in the morning to round on postpartum patients and post-op patients. Um, so I'll see them in the morning and I'll kind of go over those patients with my supervising physician. So I'll go in, check on them, do a quick exam. If they're ready to go home, I'll discharge them as well. Um, so I do have a little bit of a hospital aspect to my um, work schedule, but I'm not delivering babies um, in the hospital. That's something that my supervising physician does. Technically, PAs are trained to deliver babies and we can, um, but just for the relationship that I have with my supervising physician, because she's so busy, I tend to stay at the office and I actually absorb her schedule onto mine whenever she has to go and do a delivery. So I kind of hold the fort down and she'll go deliver. Um, that way patients don't have to reschedule and we don't have to push people back. So keep in mind, you are allowed to deliver as a PA and it just kind of depends on where you go as to whether or not that's something you'd want you to do. Um, and then on the bottom, um, this is a clue cell, which I'll talk about later in one of the cases. These are birth control pills. This is a, a baby. And this is a um, stress test. It's something that we do for monitoring. So we actually strap a monitor to your belly um, and then one to kind of trace your baby's heartbeat. And then we kind of track the um, rhythm and kind of the rate of the heartbeat in comparison to baby's movement, which you'll track on a little clicker. So this one looks a little bit older than what ours looks like, but generally the same. Um, I did want to touch on, I know a lot of people have asked about work-life balance. So as I've kind of gone through that, as you can see, for the most part, I'm pretty much out of the office by 5.30 at the latest and five o'clock on a good day. Um, so pretty much like the moment we're done with clinic, I'm, I'm done, um, which is nice. I don't take work home with me. I don't chart outside of work. I try really hard to do all my charting while I'm there at the office in between patients, which means sometimes my lunch is not going to be as long as it's supposed to be, or I'm kind of, you know, a little bit behind, but for the most part, I don't take work home with me. I don't think that that's ever a really good practice to do. Um, so certainly something to ask in terms of whenever you're applying for a job, if they're going to give you access to kind of your um, medical record system, if they're going to expect that you're logged on or putting a certain amount of time in, but um, yeah, I typically don't. Earlier when I first started as PA, I did stay a little bit later because it did take me a little bit longer to chart. But now that I've been practicing for a while, I just get everything done during the day and then I sign off and I'm done. And if I have anything left over, I'll just finish it in the morning. So um, I try not to stay late. But for the most part, I think a majority of my colleagues who, whether they work in the hospital or they, they kind of work in a slightly different setting, for the most part, most of them are not really taking their work home. So that's kind of the nice thing. You don't have to really worry too, too much about any extra stuff. So once you're kind of done with work, you can either be with your family or do whatever you want to do. Um, and I, I haven't heard that it's been an issue for anyone to find a good balance between their work life and their home life. So that's the other really nice thing about being a PA. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. So patient case. So first patient case is a pretty common one. Oh gosh, what's that? Oh, okay. So we're gonna go through these. I have two cases um, and then I'll wrap up a little bit and then we will get to the um, question and answer. I know there's been a ton of chats, but we'll kind of go through these a little bit quickly. So 48 year old female, G4P4. So basically gravita four. So she's been pregnant four times and then para four, which means she's delivered four times. Um, so everything kind of matches up there. She's coming in for heavier cycles over the past year or so. Her cycles have now increased from four days to seven, and she is kind of saturating a super tampon about every three to four hours. Um, and then now it's increasing to every one to two hours during her heavy days. And she's passing baseball size clots. So this is a patient's quotes. They, it, it varies a lot by your patient, but 
just take it with a grain of salt. So large clots to the patient. She says that she's having a lot of cramping with her cycles, but otherwise they show up pretty much at the same time every single month. Um, she doesn't have any history of bleeding disorders or fibroids. She's not taking any medication, not on any type of birth control or anything like that. She doesn't have any other um, surgical history. So this has kind of been like a chronic gradual problem that's been happening to her. So let's see. So some focused review of systems. So kind of just making sure we kind of get a full picture of what she's experiencing. So the positive, so she's feeling fatigued, she's feeling tired, dizzy, a little bit lightheaded, um, probably from the severe bleeding that she's experiencing. Um, she's not having any chest pain. She's not noticing any type of bruising or anything abnormal there. So um, that's just kind of a quick focused um, review of systems. And then we kind of got all the other information we got from her initial interview. In terms of the exam, same thing. We want to stay focused. We don't have a lot of time with this patient. So we kind of just want to look at the parts that she's kind of having an issue with. So generally she looks okay. She's not looking pale. She doesn't look like she's going to pass out on you. She still looks pretty healthy. Um, skin color looks good. She's not blue anywhere or anything like that. Um, the general urinary exam. So externally, her anatomy looks normal. We don't see anything there. Speculum exam is look, letting us look into the vaginal canal and the cervix. That looks um, normal too. So we don't see like a polyp. We don't see any cuts, any abrasions. We don't see anything that could be contributing to her bleeding. And then the bimanual exam is when we actually feel and check for the size of the uterus. And so we did the exam. Uterus is about a normal size and we don't feel any masses or anything abnormal. So next thing we want to do is some lab work. So for this patient, because she's been a long time patient, the only things I really checked were her thyroid and her blood count. Um, I know because she's having regular monthly cycles, her hormones are probably still normal. Um, so if they were kind of funky and like skipping around at her age. You also probably think like maybe it's menopause as well. And so you could check an estradiol or estrogen level, um, an FSH, which is a follicular stimulating hormone and an LH, which is a luteinizing hormone. So those three can let us know, is she kind of going through perimenopause and that's why she's getting these abnormal cycles or is she still supposed to be having regular cyclical cycles? And so for her, because we, They've been coming every single month. We're not too worried about it. The other level that you could check would be a prolactin level. It's something you secrete from your pituitary gland. And sometimes an elevated prolactin level can cause irregular cycles as well. Um, typically from like a pituitary, like microadenoma. So certainly if you're noticing like it's really starting to like skip or she's going like months without, that's something that you'd want to check as well. But for this patient, really just kind of check her thyroid, which is normal. Blood count shows that she has a little bit of an anemia. So her red blood cell count or the RBC is a little bit low. Hemoglobin is a little bit low. Hematocrit is a little bit low. So we can tell from these labs, she has been bleeding for a little while. It's been a little bit significant enough for, to where her body's not able to replace it. Um, in a quick enough fashion. Her white blood count is not elevated. So there's no type of infection or anything that the body's trying to signal to us. We also got a little sonogram. Let me move this over here. Okay, so the sonogram shows that her uterus is measuring about eight centimeters by four by five, which is normal. So anything under 10 centimeters is normal for us. Um, and so everything looks good there. The endometrium, which is that lining inside the uterus is normal as well. So anything under 11 millimeters is normal. So it's not thicker than usual. So it, nothing there to lead us to believe that for some reason it's growing really, really thick and then shedding in a really intense amount. And that's why she's seeing that heavy flow. Um, we see both ovaries, we don't see anything there and we don't see any masses. So no fibroids, nothing abnormal or irregular. Um, so pelvic sonogram is, is pretty clean. So we have this patient come back and we do an endometrial biopsy. Um, this is something that we do in the office for patients who are a little bit older, closer to menopause when they start getting these really irregular um, bleeding. The procedure is kind of similar to how you do a pap smear. We basically pass like a small, almost look like a straw with a little plunger and you pass it through the cervix 
and it just kind of suctions out like a little bit of the, the lining. Um, and that just lets us know there's not any areas that are concerning for malignancy or anything like that. And her sample was negative. Um, when we did an office, we didn't see anything abnormal and then her pathology report came back benign. So nothing there. So for this patient, um, we couldn't really find out why she was doing this. We couldn't find out why she was bleeding because she had never had a history of this before and all her workup was negative. And sometimes in medicine, you don't ever find out the exact cause of why your patient's bleeding, but we do have ways to manage it. Um, and so these are the things that we typically offer for patients with abnormal bleeding. So trans um, acetic acid, which is Lysteta or the brand name, it's an anti-coagulating uh, type factor. So it kind of stops bleeding um, or an anti-fibrinolytic. And then oral contraceptive pills is a really common one. Um, intrauterine device is another one and then endometrial ablation. So <clears throat> your reasoning for picking one method over the other is really going to be dependent on your patient. So for this patient with her being 48, she's getting pretty close to the age where we really wouldn't offer any type of um, birth control or anything like that for her. So I would say that birth control pills are not going to be for her. She hasn't been on it and she doesn't really want to. Um, intrauterine device is something we could place in the office. And so if she's interested, we could place one and leave it there for the entirety. And then by the time we would remove it, we know she should be in menopause. So we kind of take her through this irregular cycle time. Um, it is a little bit more invasive. So some people don't like it as much. Um, so that's an option that you can give to her. The ablation is something we actually do at a surgical center. We place a device, it's the NovaSure device, and it kind of cauterizes the inside of the lining. So it kind of essentially burns it and thins it out. And for a lot of those patients, once we do that, they really don't get any more bleeding or they'll get really, really light spotting. Um, the um, Lysteta, that very first medication, we give to patients who just kind of have these irregular cycles every once in a while, and they want to take the most conservative um, treatment route. And so with this medication, we basically give them the option. So if they have heavy cycle bleeding and it's like on day three or four and it's still going strong, they can take this medicine every eight hours for up to five days to get their bleeding to stop. And so they get to choose. They're like, okay, this cycle looks good. I don't have to take this medicine. My next cycle, it's looking kind of crazy. Let me go ahead and take it. So it gives them a little bit more flexibility and they don't have to take a medication every single day. So for our patient, this is what she wanted. She didn't want to have to take everything regular, you know, daily or consistently. And she didn't really want to come in to do any procedure. So that was the option that we chose for this patient. Second, I need to change this. Okay. Second case study. So this patient, she's a 20 year old female G zero P zero. So she's never been pregnant. She's never given birth. She's coming in for a complaint of vaginal odor and increased discharge for the past two weeks. So she denies any type of um, vaginal itching, pelvic pain. She doesn't have any urinary symptoms. Um, she is sexually active, but it's been with the same partner. She's not really consistently using condoms. So it's almost like she's not using condoms. <laughs> Um, and then she's not currently on any medications. She hasn't tried anything new or introduced anything that could possibly be irritating to the vagina to kind of cause these symptoms to occur. So let's go to the next slide. So kind of general exam, because we pretty much got all the history we needed from her. She's pretty young, pretty healthy. Um, general exam, she looks pretty good. Abdomen is good. A lot of times I'll feel the abdomen just to make sure there's not anything not any tenderness, anything there that could be concerning for like pelvic inflammatory disease or anything like that. Um, her genital urinary exam was, so external exam was normal. Speculum exam did show copious amounts of kind of discharge, um, which would be abnormal. And then her cervix was fine. We didn't get any cervical motion tenderness. So as I'm collecting the, um, the swab. And as I'm doing the exam, she's, she's not really feeling any pain or discomfort, um, which is good because that rules out pelvic inflammatory because people with those, they're pretty septic. You can't even really touch them because it's so inflamed and so tender. 
Um, and we did bimanual exam, everything looked normal for her. So what we usually do for these patients, we do two things. Um, for her age, because she's a little bit more high risk and she's not using condoms consistently, we'll do a wet mount. It's something we do in the office. We'll swab the vaginal canal and then we'll place it on a, a slide and look at it under the microscope. And the other thing we'll do is we'll send off a swab and we kind of do a full vaginitis panel. So it also checks for gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, and kind of yeast and BV. So it kind of just checks the, that little STD side just to make sure that's not why. So that's what we did for this patient. So we did a wet mount. So these are the things you kind of look for on a wet mount. So you look at clue cells and that is going to be this first. Can you guys see my mouse? Yes or no? I assume yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So the first is going to be a wet mount. Uh, or a clue cell. And so this is kind of be your marker for BV or bacterial vaginosis. So this border right here, these little dots are all the bacterial cells. And so clue cells, basically their borders are obscured because there's so much bacteria kind of stuck onto them. Um, and so when they do that, a lot of times they increase the discharge as they're breaking down like food and stuff like that. And then you also get this odor from them too. Uh, and that's just them breaking down their food supply and releasing that odor. Uh, it's typically pretty strong. A lot of people describe it as like a fishy or like an ammonia odor. Uh, but for her, we did not see any of these cells floating around in there. So that's most likely not the cause. Trichomonas is these guys. Um, so this picture is kind of hard to see, but these actually move. This is like a little flagella in the back. They kind of look like giant sperms essentially. Um, and they are an STI. And when you see them, it's pretty obvious because they're kind of swimming out um, all on the slide. And so trichomonas is its own STI. It's a sexually transmitted infection. Um, and so we didn't see anything for her. So that's likely not the cause of her kind of symptoms. And then this down here is yeast. So these are kind of the, the hyphae and then the spores, which you can't really see Usually they look like little snowmen. And then these just look like long, like strands essentially for yeast and infection. She did not have any of those. And um, we also checked for the presence of white blood cells um, and she did not have any present. And then the WIF test is for BB. So you'll drop on a solution and you actually smell it. And if it smells, um, there's like a specific smell it's supposed to be like, um, then it's positive and it kind of just supports that it is bacterial vaginosis. I don't typically do that in the office a lot. We just, if we see the clue cells, that's more than enough for us that it's BV, but to get that full diagnosis, you can do both of those tests together. Um, so everything was negative on just like a standard infection standpoint. So we sent the swab off. And so this is what it showed us. So these are kind of the general um, results that you'll get. So gonorrhea was negative. Her chlamydia was positive. Um, lactobacillus is kind of, um, these all are kind of normal vaginal um, flora, but usually they're a really small amount. So not enough for us to pick up. So these top two tend to be the BV category. This is the same trichomonas as we saw earlier. And these are just different species of yeast. Um, so if any of those come up positive, then we would have treated those infections. For this patient, we are gonna treat her chlamydia and we have to tell her she has chlamydia. So um, part of your job is also telling patients bad news. Um, and so really being able to counsel them and let them know um, kind of the risks of um, these infections. So we unfortunately have a lot of young patients that come in that are diagnosed with gonorrhea and chlamydia who then get reinfected by the same partner. So you have to be really, really careful about how you counsel these patients. So. This is kind of the treatments that you tend to give. So it's the azithromycin, one gram, it's a one-time dose. And then, uh, or you can do the doxycycline for seven days. Um, we do always recommend a full STD panel, which is blood work. If I see a patient that has this result um, and the blood work is gonna include HIV testing, hepatitis B and C, um, syphilis and herpes. And so if I see any of these, I tend to just recommend that they get checked for everything just in case there's something else we need to treat them for. Um, so we always offer them that as an option. 
The other thing is that we let them know we have to report the case to the CDC. So gonorrhea and chlamydia are both two cases that the CDC tracks. And so the labs report them, but you are also supposed to report these cases as well so that they can kind of track the trends um, in your area and things like that. So they let the patients know um, that we're gonna report the case. And it, they don't do anything with it as, aside from just using it as data. I know a lot of people are really concerned about that, but mostly it's more for a research and a treatment perspective and an epidemiology standpoint. So they're not gonna announce it to the world or publish it or anything like that. So you, you kind of have to talk patients through that a little bit too. Um, the main thing is that we have patients abstain. So they are not to have any intercourse until they come back for a test of cure in eight to 12. 12 weeks. And that's about how long it takes for your body to clear gonorrhea and chlamydia. So they're both very, very resistant. Um, and sometimes even in that time frame, it's not enough. And we actually have to retreat or give patients an additional dose of the medication. Um, we always tell them they need to have their partners tested. And even if their partners test negative, they need to be treated regardless because they had a positive test. Um, for a lot of times, it's a little bit harder for men to get tested. They don't do a lot of urethral swabs. For men, it tends to be a urine test, so it's not going to be as accurate. But if, but all of that kind of trumps the fact that our patient tested positive, so we know that they're going to have they're going to have to get treated, and they need to just avoid their partner until they've come back for the test of cure, and we have um, pathology that shows they've completely cleared the infection. It's really important to educate patients because I've had a lot of patients ask me. Are you sure it's sexually transmitted? How could this be possible? Cause I've been with this person for a year. Um, or is it possible that from sharing underwear, from sharing stuff like that. And that is kind of your time to really let the patients know this is a sexually transmitted disease. You get it from sex. Um, and it's a, a, a lot of educating the patient at that point so that they know what's gonna be the best for them and the risk of being reinfected with this. Um, and kind of how that can affect them long-term. So um, a lot of being a PA is patient education, really giving them all the information they need to make those decisions and giving them as much um, understanding as possible in regards to their diagnosis and their treatment. Um, so that is gonna be this patient. Okay, so to kind of just quickly wrap up. So some things that you're gonna probably encounter as a PA, um, that I don't know if anyone's gonna tell you about, but not every person, so not every physician, not every patient is gonna know how to utilize a PA. So a lot of things that you have to do during your time as a practicing PA is advocating for your profession, letting others know what your scope of practice is and what you're able to do. Um, and that was how it was at my current office. So I'm the first PA that they've ever hired. So it was a little bit of a learning curve of figuring out how to work with each other. And so I um, kind of showed them my skill set. I kind of talked about my training and I kind of showed them through my work what I was able to do. And eventually they were able to kind of get a better understanding and give me that kind of autonomy I needed to practice um, in order to be the most efficient for, for them, for their, for their practice and for their patients. Um, so keep in mind, not every place is gonna understand um, what a PA can do. So you always wanna advocate for your profession, you know, let people know what you're capable of. And a way that you can do that as well as being active with local legislation. So this is PA PACT or the PA Political Action Committee. Um, this one is specifically for TAPA um, in Texas. They um, kind of take any, anything that PAs ask for and kind of try to push for local legislation to make it real actionable things. So because of um, the PA Pact, PAs are now able to volunteer in Texas without a supervising physician. Um, we were able to sign death certificates for hospice patients, which we were not able to do before. We are able to read radiology um, and have that count in terms of like billing and like le um, the legalities of it. So they do a lot of great things. Every state is gonna be a little bit different. So it really depends on your local chapter, but definitely look into that because that's gonna affect what you can do for your patients. And then final advice. Um, so just know the traditional path is not for everyone. We had a lot of people who um, were in my class as like a, this was their second career choice. We had people who were teachers, people who are research assistants, people who did completely other, you know, other jobs like accountants. Um, who switched into the VA profession. So it's definitely possible if it's something you're interested in, 
you can definitely do it and just know that it's that is not going to be anything against you whenever you're applying. PA schools like to see people who have done other stuff who have that initiative and who can stick with it. Um, keep track of everything you do, which is what that Excel sheet that I talked about. Um, and make sure at the end of the day that going into medicine is something that you want to do. Taking care of people, um, kind of being that person that has an actual hand in someone's life um, and their overall well being and their outcome. It's a very serious responsibility and sometimes can be very, very stressful. So make sure that it's something that you feel comfortable with, something that you wanna do long-term um, and that you have a good support system that can kind of help you through it whenever it gets tough. So um, let's see. So I think we are gonna go ahead and move on to the Q and A and this chat kind of looks crazy. So I'm gonna see if anyone has any questions. I can only see so many. Um, let's see. Oh gosh. Okay. Where do I, hold on. I'll start here. So I've been having a hard time finding the average pay. How do you compare it? So in terms of pay, so whenever you um, start applying for jobs, something that AAPA, the American Academy of um, PAs produces is a salary report. So um, a lot of practicing PAs in all 50 states will um, submit information about their salary, how many hours they work. Um, and so you'll get to see in that in that report kind of what the different percentiles are. So um, I think for PAs, um, the 50th percentile in terms of pay, I think is going to be like a six figure salary. Um, so it kind of just depends though, because I think every state is going to be a little bit different, but just know there are a lot of resources out there. So once you get to that, or if you know anyone that has that, um, you can kind of look through that salary report and it lays out every single specialty, um, you know, bonuses, sign on things. So it has everything. So it's really, really in depth, but Obviously, it's not going to pay as much as a physician, so just know that our training is different. It's not as long, so in terms of pay at the end of the day, it's not going to be the same, but it's still a well-paying career, so you're still able to, you know, kind of do the things you need to do, pay off your student loans, and still live your life at the end of the day. Um, let's see. Where do I see myself in 10 years? Um, probably still a PA. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do OBGYN long-term. Um, I'm kind of interested in family medicine. Um, hospital medicine. So I'm not sure. It's going to depend. Um, but I just get into it um, in 10 years and trying something new. Let's see. Um, and you guys tell me when I need to cut off or how many more questions I can take. Okay. Um, let's see here. Is women's health a competitive specialty? I will say yes, it is. Um, there's not a lot of PA positions out there in women's health, and that's because PAs tend to stay there. It's kind of the same thing with family medicine. So once PAs find those jobs, they tend to stay there. So there's not as many positions open. Um, and there are at least one or two available. Um, a lot of times they'll also have NPAs in the hospital or clinics that are associated with the hospital as well. So um, I do recommend looking into that, but the, the specialties that tend to have a lot of opening for PAs would be like orthopedics. They have tons of PAs. Pediatrics take a ton of PAs. ER medic uh, medicine or trauma medicine takes a lot of PAs. Um, a lot of oncology here in Texas like to utilize PAs too. So there are some fields where they have tons and tons of PAs. Um, and then there are a couple, and I'd say women's health is one of them where it's a little bit more selective and there's not as many opportunities, but eventually if you keep looking, I know you'll find some because I, I just saw some the other day. Um, see, I already answered that one. I kind of talked about OBGYN earlier, but if I had to do a second choice, I'd probably pick um, family medicine. And I think that's something I really want to do. I, I think for a lot of PAs that are in family medicine, they like doing it because it's such a challenge. They kind of get to do anything, um, from like pediatrics all the way to geriatrics. And you kind of be able, you're able to kind of handle all of it. So, um, I think it's a good test of your, your skill or your knowledge to do family. So I think that'd be really cool. Um, what ways can we study for the GRE? So I just bought like two test prep books 
And then just like whatever online tests I could get from like the companies, from the books, um, from whatever random, not random sites, but whatever like GRE test sites, I would do that. I actually, I did not um, spend a lot of time studying for this. I spent about two weeks and then I just took the tests, but I was kind of in the mode of like studying for undergrad. So I was already studying for long hours every day. So I was like, I might as well just keep going. So that's what I did. Um, hey too. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can answer like one more question and then we'll wrap up because people are starting to leave. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me see this one. Um, okay, I'll just quickly talk about this nurse's question. Um, so roles that nurses play in my workplace and what relationship. So in terms of nurses, so we, I really only interact with nurses in the um, hospital. So they take care of our patients. And a lot of times, depending on who's available, they'll either reach out to myself or to Dr. Watts, who's my supervising physician. So I work pretty closely with nurses. So with RNs and LVNs. In terms of NPs, I personally have not worked with a lot of nurse practitioners, but a lot of times they are our colleagues. So they kind of work on the same level um, in the same scope of practice that we do. So um, it is pretty common. A lot of offices will have both NPs and PAs together if they're a bigger office. So it's, it's pretty common and usually it's a pretty easy relationship. Um, yeah, okay. So I'll kind of just close it off there. Sorry to everyone else. I know there's like tons of questions, but I'll just kind of close it. Well, thank you so much, too, for presenting today. I definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody did as well. Um, if you guys haven't taken the quiz, please do. It will close 30 minutes after this ends. And I did see a lot of people are saying there's a question that's incorrect, so I will look into that and fix it. Um, we do have another event coming up on October 15th with a second-year medical student, so be sure to sign up for that if you're interested. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to DM us on Instagram or in the spot.